So first things first, I was going to say thank you for 10,000 subscribers, but as of the time I'm filming this, that was now 5,000 ago. I think I had like 8,500 or something like that when I first posted that video, and now it's just like exploding. So yeah, thank you guys so much for that, by the way. So needless to say, you guys really liked that last video so much so you can even find articles written about me if you look online. But reading your guys' comments on the last video inspired me to want to keep working on it, so we're going to get into it and see what I've done to make this thing a little more special. Alright, so what's up guys? As you can see, very big things coming to the channel. I've now just invested in a whiteboard. Now anyways, at the end of the last video, the crankshaft here ended up bending, because it wasn't very strong. Now there was a lot of speculation in the comments addressing why this might have happened. And the first thing people immediately jumped to was the fact that there was a lack of grease, which it's not. I actually made sure to off-camera add a copious amount of grease to literally every single thing that touches another thing. The other thing too is people actually suggested that instead of using PLA to print this, I should have printed it in PETG, which PETG is a lot stronger, and that's a really good suggestion. Oh, hell no. Nah. The only issue is this is already made out of PETG, so it doesn't actually matter. Now naturally, this led me to make this. This is the same crankshaft, however it's a little bit thicker, and it's actually 100% infill. The last one I think was made like 50% infill, and it failed pretty easily. Although it did only fail when it was pushed up to its upper limit, so I'm hoping that this will make up enough difference that it can be strong enough, and we can continue on testing. Now I want to see if adding this makeshift can exhaust is going to change the sound at all, so... Uh, let's see how it sounds. Hi, it's me again. I actually broke a second one. Holy crap, guys, it's broken again. So uh, behind me are some various options I think that we can use to narrow down the solution of the problem. Uh, and if you think that this is written by a child, it actually was. I do support child labor. Uh, I don't actually have a tougher material. And to be honest, if I were to use something like nylon, uh, nylon does have a lot more give to it, but that is kind of the problem. Uh, even at higher PMs, the flywheel is going to be <laughs> flapping around. So I'm just going to cross that one off the list as well. Oh, what the heck is this, you might be asking? Well, let me explain. Well, if we look at these two diagrams that I really quickly drew up, you can see that when the piston is on its downward stroke, it actually causes the crankshaft to bend a little bit. This is a bit of an exaggerated drawing, but the case is also true when it's on its upward stroke because of the inertia of the piston moving upwards. Now, what actually happens is that the piece will begin to warm up more and more and more as you're bending it. And this is what's causing our deformation and thus our problem. Now a very obvious and simple solution to this is to actually make a crankshaft out of steel. Now I could do this, I could, but I'm not going to because I feel like it kind of goes against everything this engine sort of stands for. And uh, I, feel, I like the idea of a pretty much almost entirely 3D printed engine because this means that you guys uh, at home could print a lot of these parts and just make them yourself. So I'm gonna continue to challenge myself to actually make a 3D printed crankshaft. And I think what I'm gonna have to do is remake the bottom end with a new crankshaft. And let's go see what that's gonna look like. Okay, so I actually lost the footage uh, that I was supposed to use for this part, so bear with me. Pretty much what I did is I just started by taking the bottom end apart. Uh, and then I went up and I cleaned up all the parts. And instead of just swapping out the crankshaft uh, with a much thicker one, I made a much stronger connecting rod too, uh, to make, you know, so things don't break. So at first I thought that by lining the cylinder with graphite was going to help uh, as a lubricant, which it didn't. Uh, so by adding grease to it after, it kind of made this like gross black mess on it. So I ended up just wiping that off and just adding new grease anyways. To make room for the new hardware too, I also had to make the coal crankcase a lot bigger. Uh, that's why it kind of doesn't look right, but I also wasn't going to make a new cylinder as well, just so the crankcase would look proper. So yeah, that's why it's a little kind of at the bottom. And now this should hopefully fix our problem. But you know what sucks? Manually controlling the VTEC. I mean, really, what's the point of VTEC if it's just a button that you have to push? Like, imagine going through a drag race and losing because you pushed it at the wrong time. Uh, can, can we do that again? I pushed the button at the wrong time. You're just afraid that it would have given you the train length. Now, a lot of you guys had left so many comments about how to do this, and pretty much all of them focused around the idea of using a flyball governor. Uh, I like this idea and it makes perfect sense, uh, except that it kind of doesn't really work. It's not that it doesn't work, it's just that the issue I have with it is that one, it would take so much space on the side of the engine uh, to make it work at all, 
Uh, and I would also have to come up with a linkage system to make uh, when the governor opens enough that it would actually actuate the VTEC. Uh, and I just kind of wasn't looking for that. Uh, but then I got thinking, holy crap, I can just use the exhaust. Kind of similar to how an EGR works where it reroutes the exhaust gas back into the intake, uh, I can actually reroute the exhaust gas into a diaphragm piston, and when it reaches the right pressure, it will actually actuate the VTEC that way. Now the way to get that pressure is the engine has to be at a certain RPM and delivering enough exhaust pressure. And the way I did that is by using a valve on the outlet side. The lower this valve is, the more back pressure there is in the exhaust, and therefore the actuation will happen sooner. This is all just theoretical stuff, so how about we actually go and test and see if it's going to work. Alright, so I've set it up. Uh, as you can see, the exhaust is now running through this little cylinder thing here. And this is what's going to actuate the valve changeover. I just need to spend some time tuning this to find the correct RPM to have the valves change over. kicking in. Finally, we have an engine with VTEC, and it kicks in by itself, and it sounds pretty damn powerful. But how powerful is it really? Now, beyond just comment section speculation, an actual way to determine the power is by using a dynamometer. Now, these are essentially just instruments that tell you how much power an engine makes at a certain RPM. They have a very simple working principle, and that's essentially multiplying the amount of torque the engine makes at that specific RPM. Or, in other words, how much force the engine is applying to a big disc, and how quickly it's applying that force. Alright, so we have two ways to go about this. The first way is to use some kind of resistance dimenometer, uh, kind of like a eddy brake thing or something with a proning brake. This works because it puts a certain load on the engine at certain RPMs, and the system reads how much load that is, and it uses that to determine how much power it's making across its rev range. Though these are a little bit more complicated, and they require some technology that I don't really want to get into, so I'm not going to do this at all. Now the second method is way simpler. It literally requires a big disc. Now this is called an inertia dyno, and it has a very simple working principle. If we have a disc that's not spinning, and we try to spin it from 0 RPMs to maybe 500 RPMs, it takes a certain amount of force to make that happen. So if I just spin this flywheel from one known speed to another known speed, and we time how long that will take, we can actually use that to determine how much horsepower our engine makes. Okay, so for the setup to work, we have to actually be able to monitor how fast the flywheel is spinning over time. And my method for doing this is to actually place the recording head from a cassette player uh, right next to a spinning magnet. Now the reading head on a cassette player is literally just an electromagnet, so by having a magnet pass by it uh, once every revolution, I can actually plug this into an audio recording device, and then over time, uh, we can sample the duration it takes between each of the peaks. Alright, so now that we have a nice little setup here, uh, let's find out if VTEC really does this justice.
one thing I noticed is that the valves were like sticking, so I actually had to stick my fingers on them to help it open more. So when I was doing the VTEC run, I noticed the engine was getting like kind of more tired. It was kind of hard to explain, so I just took the best run from that one. Now, unfortunately, we can't just look at this disc spinning and go, mm, yes, holes, Pella. Uh, we've got to do a little bit of math and analysis to kind of dig it out. So let me explain how that's going to work. Okay, so our first step is to actually sample the audio and determine what the frequency is at certain points. Then once we have the frequency of that, we can convert that to angular velocity. By doing this in sort of steps, uh, we can actually just build an approximate graph and use that approximation to find the horsepower a little bit easier. Now the reason for doing an approximation instead of just doing it continuously over time is one, it's easier, and two, because the data is not super accurate anyways, uh, an approximation should give us a very close answer of what we can expect. Now we only really care about the acceleration of the flywheel because that's actually what requires power. So what we need to do is to determine how much acceleration is occurring at each of the points. If we just make a tangential line at each of the points and then use the derivative of that line, we can actually find out the rate at which that should be accelerating at that point. Now, since we know what the moment of inertia is of this disc, uh, what we can do is actually multiply the moment of inertia by how much is accelerating at each of those points. And this will tell us how much torque the engine is applying to the flywheel uh, across its rev range. Now, to actually find out how much horsepower we're making, all we need to do is multiply the amount of torque the engine makes at each of those points by its RPM at that point, and then divide it all by 5,252. And this will give us the amount of horsepower the engine's making at that point. And if we do this for every single point along its rev range, we can actually build an approximate graph of the uh, horsepower over time. It's a very lengthy process, but it should work nonetheless. And after killing a whole afternoon doing it, the results are in. Now, without VTEC, I determined that at its peak, this engine makes a whopping 0.005155 horsepower at its peak. This is actually blank. I was just reading off my phone. There were some issues with it. For instance, uh, it only reached a maximum of 860 RPM at 60 PSI. And also, it was dropping out sort of across the rev range. I'm not really too sure why that was. But the question is, did we gain any power with VTEC? And the answer is yes, actually. With VTEC, the engine actually had a peak of 0.00629 horsepower. Not only that, it also gained a maximum of 1200 RPM over the 860 that it had before. Uh, just to put this into perspective, if I wanted to engine swap this into my car, I would have to have approximately 16,000 of these just to make 100 horsepower. So it looks like VTEC really does add more power, even if it has a more restrictive exhaust. Uh, I think this can be chalked up to the fact that the valve opens for a little bit longer too, so there's more power occurring during the stroke, uh, which gives it a little bit more torque. There are also some flaws of this dyno setup as well, so I suspect that this number isn't completely accurate. For example, this TPU coupler that I'm using here is probably sapping a lot of the power away through something like friction. Uh, but in the future, I'll probably work on a more efficient system. But this engine only has one cylinder. Uh, in the future, I could make a much better one. Maybe one that's three times as good. Anyways, guys, that's everything I had planned for this video. And if you enjoyed this kind of stuff, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss whatever junk I make in the future. Anyways, that's it for today. See you guys.